welcome. Um, we are so glad to see everyone joining. I think we'll give it um, maybe just a minute or so as I see um, folks still joining maybe from, from the last session. Um, thanks for, for being here with us. Hello, let me offer an official welcome to our keynote um, this, um, this evening or afternoon, or perhaps morning for some of you, if you're um, making a visit from um, a time where it maybe is not super convenient to be at, a, at this um, talk. We're very glad you're here, whatever time it is um, where you're located. Um, you're here at FORCE 2023, which is the annual conference of the FORCE 11 community. Um, the global membership of FORCE 11, we're all individuals working together to make positive changes in scholarly communication. And you're welcome to become a member. Membership is free and you can get details on our website. Um, this is a community effort and we want to um, thank all of our sponsors who have helped make this event possible. Um, a few details about the conference. Um, the sessions are all taking place on Zoom. Recordings will be made available after the event. Um, you can see the conference website, um, code of conduct, and the ability to join the um, discussions about the conference on Slack. And if you're going to be um, posting about the conference on social media, the hashtag is force 11 dash conference. A heads up on a event that um, registration has just opened, I believe, for Fiske 2023. Um, the theme of the event this year is enhancing the global impact of open scholarship, um, taking place um, July 31st through August 4th. Um, the the Fiske is the Force 11 Scholarly Communication Institute. And we hope that you'll learn more about that event and hopefully um, we will see you there also. Um, with these um, general conference uh, messages out of the way, I will now um, introduce our speaker. Um, we are so pleased today to have uh, Soledad Quiroz of Valenzuela here. Dr. Quiroz Valenzuela is a researcher in open science at the Universidad Central de Chile. She was executive secretary of the Chilean Scientific Committee on Climate Change between 2020 and 2021. In September, 2021, she was elected vice president for policy of the International Network for Government Science Advice and is a member of the Latin American and Caribbean Science Diplomacy Network. She holds a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from Michigan State University and a master's in public policy and management from Carnegie Mellon. She's been a lecturer and researcher in science and technology policy, science advice, and science diplomacy. And her message for us today is about open science policy, uh, dreams, and reality. Um, it's my pleasure now um, to turn the meeting over to Soledad Quiroz Valenzuela. Thank you, Jennifer, um, so much for the introduction and the invitation. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here and uh, share with you some thoughts, uh, some wisdom, like I said before, uh, before everybody got here, that I collected during these years and how um, makes sense for me when, when I put it together with open science. 
So I'm gonna start um, sharing my presentation with you. Let's see. And um, I would like to um, encourage you to, to ask questions in, in the chat and uh, we can go back to, to that after the presentation, but uh, I would really like to hear from you what, what your thoughts are, um, if you have some ideas to share, it will be very nice to hear them too. Um, so a little bit more about me is that my, my um, journey um, in science or in uh, life has been very um, uncommon. So I, I did a biochemistry um, undergrad in Chile, and then I went for my PhD to the United States. And when I was finishing, I started to think that I really wanted science to be part of um, the people's life and really make uh, uh, a contribution to people's lives in my country. So I thought the best way to do that was through science policy, not through uh, biochemistry in a lab. So I went for a master's in public policy and then went back to Chile to um, try to understand how I could really put science to work for development. And it wasn't easy. There wasn't a science ministry in my country. Um, the budget in science has been very low for all our history, I will say. Uh, scientists in Chile are very few. So it was, it was hard to build a community and start talking about this. But uh, things are moving forward. And I also was lucky enough to get to meet the people from uh, INSA, the International Network for Governmental Science Advice. Um, and through that organization, I've got training. I've got the opportunity to meet science advisors around the world and, and get to learn from their experience. And it's been a really a wonderful experience. Um, and now I am working in Universidad Central de Chile, um, developing the policy for open science for the university. And that has opened yet another chapter uh, that I was kind of aware of before, but not really as deep as I am now. And it's been really uh, been a wonderful experience to understand much better how open science can really help put science for the service of the people. So um, that was a little bit about me. So you understand that I'm not coming from a political um, background or, but I was really moving into these issues little by little. And um, that's why I will start with what are public policies, how I understand public policies, why making policies is so difficult, and uh, why we always complain that policies are not well done and well written, or why they have so many troubles. Um, then I'm going to go into open science policies and give you just few examples from Latin America and talk a little bit more about the context in Latin America. So um, first, as a good uh, scientist, I'm going to start with definitions. What are public policies? And the definition I really like the most is this one because it's so simple, but it really helps you understand the um, why uh, applications of, of policies. And um, it says anything that a government chooses to do or not to do. And I think it's a great definition because it allows you, allows a government to point what are their priorities, where are their concerns, and where are not. 
And that second part is as important as the first part. The, the do is very important, but do not. What is not within the important field or what is not going to be addressed in this government, I think is as important as the do part. Um, and the other um, definition that I think is very helpful is this one, the authoritative allocation of values for the whole society. The authority part is, is kind of um, scary, but what I'm more uh, interested is in the values part, because when a government chooses something, it's also showing their values. It's showing where uh, priorities are, but according to some core values that they're gonna defend and they're gonna um, take care of, uh, they're gonna uh, respond to. So these two parts, I think, are very important when we think about policies in general for a country, public policies. Um, but it is important to recognize what policies do not do <laughs> or what we cannot expect from policies. And that's why I have this um, graph here because policies can be in a, in a strategic level of, of decision-making. So they're gonna be tied to principles and values but mostly they're gonna respond to those values. They're gonna respond to those priorities and they're gonna set up like the broad lines where we should move in a certain field, certain context, okay? What policies are not going to do is give us the details, the operative level, the practices and the standards. Those things we cannot expect from policies usually are not in policies. Policies are gonna give you broader guidelines, but not details. And those details we have to work out in different contexts, different communities. And it's good because probably you will recognize the huge differences, for example, among a different uh, fields of knowledge. So if we have a policy of open science that says, uh, for example, books are going to be the most important thing in open science, well, there's a lot of uh, fields that are gonna start complaining about it because it doesn't apply to them. So that policies don't go to the operative level is a good thing because it allows for different groups and different communities. It, it allows for diversity, okay? So every time you think about a policy and what it's not doing and um, well, maybe it's because it's, it's not the policy that should be um, giving you that detail, but um, a regulation uh, or another instrument. Uh, why making policies work is so difficult? And we can go um, into very different aspects of this, but one of the first things I learned is that when you create a policy, uh, first, you have to define a problem. You, you choose a problem um, that you want to work on. Then, um, you identify the options. How are you going to solve that problem? How are you going to approach it? Um, and, and then you start defining the, the lines. Where are you gonna move? Then you select a policy. You select how you're gonna work on that problem. You implement it. And that is the most difficult part because you need um, a lot of resources to implement. You need a lot of people, you know, you need people to be uh, knowledgeable about an issue. 
um, you need to organize it in a certain way. And then you evaluate how that implementation and how that policy has worked to solve the problem, to, to um, make uh, changes in the, in the uh, field that you were. And you uh, raise awareness of the issue and how is, is that working? And then you repeat because through your policy, hopefully you got some changes. Hopefully you got, got some impact and that is going to change the culture. That's going to change um, the, um, the organization that where, uh, where you are. That is going to change how people do things. So maybe you find a different problem to solve now. Maybe you didn't fix the problem, you made it worse. Maybe um, the implementation was not really up to point, so you have to fix that part. So you are always or should always be going around this circle, uh, thinking about the problem, thinking if it's going the way you expect it to go. And if you're identifying things that you didn't see before and change the policy, change the uh, whole problem definition maybe. So this is not simple, but um, it gets even more complicated when you do it in real life. Because all of this is happening at the same time. You are getting a lot of people telling you how to solve this problem. You are getting a lot of people telling you what not to do, how to do it, uh, how to fix this, how to move that, how to do the evaluation. And this is a, a, a graph um, just showing how messy it can get. Um, for, for a national policy, um, you get evidential input, meaning scientific data, but you also get public opinion. Um, you also get a lot of advocates, policy analysts, uh, private sector people, political input. So all of this is happening at the same time you are either creating or evaluating or implementing your policies. And, and this is what I would like to call politics. So it doesn't matter where you go, uh, how you do it, uh, we are always going to have politics. And I'm pretty sure if you work in a university, you know politics is also in universities. Um, we cannot shy away from it. We might not like it, but it's always there. And uh, it's better to, to recognize it. And it makes things more complicated. Um, and if you go into more detail, if, if we go and look at the components of an institutional policy. You see there are a lot of parts in it. So you have these external complexities because this circle has also layers down, um, not just the external inputs, but the internal parts are also complicated to outline and to um, to make consistent. So you should have a purpose um, according to your problem. And you, have, you should have a scope. And this is one of the most important parts. You have to define where, how far are you going? Um, and it's, it's really important, like the definition to define what to do, how far are you going to go? And um, stick to those limits. Uh, well, a statement that is going to specify the guidelines of, of the policy, procedures, but more than procedures, it's not the detail, like I said before, it's more like guidelines. Not 
and you you don't go into details because you have to allow for people to implement it in a way that makes sense for them for their context so you give them certain rules that you really cannot um, live without but you have to give them space to adapt it and then you have to also think about how are you going to make those procedures to be enforced if there's not a way to monitor or enforce those rules those rules mean nothing and that's very common in in policies in latin america that they are are very big on statements but then the procedures are very lax and there's almost no monitoring or not not a way to enforce it and if you don't have that um your your policy is, is definitely not going to be implemented Finally, and that's, I think, one of also the important parts, but we often forget the revision process. We have to think about how that policy is going to be evaluated, how it's going to be adapted uh, in time. You don't want a policy to stick for too long. If, if you have the same rules for too long, people tend to start playing the game, okay? They start to find the ways around it to make it more easy or looser or um, it, it loses effectivity. You don't create change anymore. You just have another rule that people place with, but it's not effective anymore. So you have to think how to revision this, um, this policy, and maybe you're going to have to replace it all together after five years because the context, the, the new uh, normal is so different from what you had. You have to think about a, a whole new policy, or maybe you just have to add more parts to it. So that part has to be um, detailed in a policy. Um, and, and allow for processes to make to be made also in a, in the medium term. So not only at the end, let's say you have a policy for five years, you should have also a process that is going to make um, adjustment or allow for adjustments in, in the meantime in case you see some big changes or adjustments. So when we think about open science policies, all these complexities I was telling you about, um, and then you add this beautiful uh, foster taxonomy. Uh, I mean, when the first time I saw this, uh, I started to shake because it's, it's beautiful, but it's also so complicated. There's so many parts to open science. Um, yes, open access is, is one part of it, and it's in itself complicated to implement, and it's getting more complicated every day because different people is applying it in a different way. So when you take open data, reproducible research, science evaluation, science tools. I mean, again, you add another axis of complexity. So how can we create open science policies that are effective and can work? Well, we have to consider where we are um, and define, like I said before at the beginning with the circle, you have to define one problem, one aspect you want to tackle. You cannot do a policy for everything. So even if you, the title of your policy is open science policy, well, you, you have to put it in parts. 
you have to consider the time frame. And depending on where you are, um, how far you can go and what's the complexity of the process that you want to tackle, you have to think when to start the process of um, of changing practices or introducing new regulations and for how long. If you're gonna make, or if you're trying to make as many of the open science policies, try to make cultural changes, you have to consider at least two years for that to be taken up. And then another two years to settle a little, uh, to evaluate them. Um, then you have to consider the institutional structure. So it's gonna be different if you're gonna uh, create or um, think about a policy for a country or a university. What rules a university is going to be very different from what rules a country and how uh, that university is, um, its position within the context in the country is also different. So for example, Universidad Central de Chile, where I'm at, is a small university, it's a small private university. That means that we are not a huge player in um, the rules that apply, for, for example, for um, certification of universities. We cannot push for very big changes in the way that universities are evaluated in Chile. If we were one of the top two or three universities in Chile, we could be bold and, and go forward with some um, very innovative policies, but we are a very small university. So we have to uh, learn to play with those rules first um, and maybe be a little bit less innovative. Um, then, and this is, I think, the most complex. We have, we have to think about the cultures. And I say cultures in plural, because again, you have different groups of people being affected and being players in this policy world. So every time you make a policy, you start with a, a map of actors, map of stakeholders. Each stakeholder, each group of people is going to be affected and is going to be motivated um, by different things. What they think is important and what is going to uh, make them take the, the policy that you are proposing it's very different for each group. And you have to get to learn what their motivations and what their, how are they gonna be impacted by, by uh, the policies that you propose. So all of this, you have to also consider when you design a policy. Okay. Um, so thus far, I've talked about how difficult this can be, but I don't want to, uh, you to walk away with just, this is almost impossible to do. It's, it's in fact possible to do open science policies. What are things that usually work? And you probably know this better than me, interoperable platforms. That means, you have to have shared standards and hopefully open software. Um, something that is as um, open to other um, systems as possible um, is usually much better. The, the problem with that is the shared standards. And again, you probably know that better than me. A second point is that you have to think about the business model. 
And what that means is you have to think about a sustainable fair for all system in, in the way that the work that everybody puts in it is rewarded, is recognized. Um, you cannot create a system that it's it, it um, heavily taxes or heavily asks for work in one group and too little from another because it's gonna it's it's not gonna work for too long. So you have to think about uh, a system that is sustainable. In in our case in Latin America, we tend to create communities and um, rely a lot on um, voluntary work. The problem with that is that we get people very excited at the beginning, but then you don't have, people doesn't have enough time to do what they want to do. So they start falling off the train and the system doesn't work anymore. Uh, if, you, if we get people to do too much work, we have to pay them. We have to give them a structure that will support them. So not rely on, only on voluntary work, for example. Capacities. Um, it is very important to think uh, how much people know about uh, issues and and practices and um, standards and, um, and recognize the different roles that you're going to need in that system to play. And that people has to have adequate training. Um, for us, what has happened in Latin America is that, um, for example, um, people that work in libraries don't usually have training in computer science. So they will work together with engineers, but um, many of the things that librarians use for cataloging, for example, um, will be difficult to communicate with engineers. And so we don't have like an interface and Eventually, people get to be trained in, the, in this interface, but um, that requires adequate training. And at the beginning, we didn't thought about that, and, and systems will collapse because we didn't have enough capacities. Um, I also learned that, for example, in a, in a university in the United States, what they did was to uh, hire external people to um, install an OSF system in the university. But then they left, they were contractors. So the capacities were not built into the people that work in the university. And so eventually the OSF was not really a resource used by the people because they didn't have enough support capacities to really use it um, or or learn to use it. Um, you had to take too much time to, to learn to use this new resource and they didn't have the people there to help. So they lost that investment. And finally, it is so important to have the right incentives. Like I said before, you have to know your people, you have to know your cultures. So you have to differentiate communities and measure the impacts on each of them uh, in, in a different way. Again, if, if you go to different academic communities, they're gonna have uh, some incentives to do open science practices that are very, very different from what librarians are going to do because their roles are different their, the way that their job is evaluated is different. Um, the way that they uh, value open science is different. So 
you have to accommodate, you have to allow for those different roles and different incentives to be part of the system to make it work. Okay, so um, here I'm just going to tell you a little bit about two examples in Latin America. These are from uh, one from Colombia and one from Chile. But first, just to give you a little bit of context, when you uh, review the Latin American policies in open science, usually what you get is a lot of open access policies and a lot of open access movement. Why is that? Because for us, the uh, main principle, the main value that we see in open science is knowledge as a public good. Um, and that resonates a lot with our culture, like a deeper culture as Latin Americans. Um, we, we have a very strong sense of family and, and shared community. So for us, institutions based on communities are very natural. Um, and, and that's basically at the beginning of each policy, each uh, statement of purpose of policies in open science throughout Latin America. How we do open science in Latin America, we usually adapt it without much thinking from what comes from the North, from the uh, United States, from uh, Europe. Um, we play this, this role of um, this game of catching up. We think that we are trying to catch up to your development. Uh, so we try to do our best because we have fewer, much fewer resources. Like I said, um, and that's not only the case for Chile, but for all Latin America, the investment in science and technology is very low. It's less than 1% of GDP um, in, in average. So it's, it's very low. And that means that we have very few scientists and very few resources. When, and this is for how long policies uh, should work, and all the statements are uh, usually long-term statements. They are very, we, we have very, Spanish is a very uh, flamboyant language and it's going to be very pretty and very long statement of how uh, good is for humanity to have shared knowledge. But then when we come to the details, um, we kind of go small. <laughs> and I think that is because we have one fewer resources. So if we really want to do something, we have to do something small like repositories. Repositories is something that is easy for us to do, to implement, um, but it's not gonna create too much burden on, on people and on budgets. And uh, those long-term statements are usually converted into short-term actions short-term memory, why? Because of our political instability, unfortunately. And that has been the case in the last uh, probably 10 years, eight years. Governments are very short uh, standing. They, they, we have had a lot of political instability. You get right, uh, win, winning one election and the next one goes to the left. And that means policies from one government are stretched out, I mean, are taken into the garbage for the next government. And you start over with new policies and that doesn't really allow for great development. Uh, so 
should be, I think, that our policy should be on shorter terms, so less grandiloquent, less uh, ambitious, but that can be done with our resources in the time frame that is granted to each government. I think we will be much more um, successful if we did that kind of short-term um, uh, statements. The uh, Colombian government has uh, very recently um, published their open science policy. And this is a very well thought, very, very um, carefully created, carefully crafted policy for the whole country. It goes again, like I said, um, with the principles of democratic democratization of knowledge, meaning that we need to share the knowledge that we create. And if you start reading a little bit more in detail, is the, the final objective is to increase the social impact of science in Colombia. The current state in Colombia is pretty much uh, the one that is in every country in Latin America. First of all, we have lack of financial resources. There's never enough. Um, second is very low knowledge on open science benefits. So we have a, a very big barrier there to uh, convince scholars to go into open science because they don't know much about it in terms of benefits, in terms of what are the practices and how they can benefit from it. Um, there's also lack of incentives because the systems of um, academic evaluations are not framed in the open science context. So what that means is usually you will get evaluated of, of for how many uh, papers you publish in top rank um, journals. And you can add to that uh, weak technological structures. So it's not a very um, optimistic state of, of affairs uh, in, in Colombia, but it also means that uh, you can you can advance things very quickly if you put uh, some resources and uh, energy into it. What are the aims of this policy? Um, well, I I uh, summarize it into three points. First, foster regulations based on open science model, meaning that you have to adapt the incentives, you have to adapt the, the way that knowledge is being produced in uh, Colombia uh, and how it's being evaluated. That also implies that they have to create a whole new systems of metrics and incentives because it's not just the, the general regulations for the universities, it's also the uh, small details like incentives for, um, well, it's not details because they are important, but it, it goes from something strategic to something very operative, like how you make people um, in like uh, libraries to follow the open science model. And finally, strengthen the knowledge and infrastructures because those are two basic building blocks for, for open science or any change they want to uh, build in the way that they create knowledge. How are we driving change in Chile? And that's what I think uh, we're trying to do from our project. Uh, this, this started long ago, sharing knowledge. And I have to comment here the work of uh, Ricardo Hartley on that respect. He has been promoting open science and open access in Chile for, for many, many years. 
Um, we had to secure funding because open science and open access is so new that we had to secure a funding to actually work on it. Like I said before, you cannot rely only on voluntary work. You have to pay people so they can dedicate time and, and effort to, to changing the world. <laughs> um, so once we secure funding with this project, we start understanding deeply the cultures in the university, the, the, the academic culture, the librarian culture, the um, decision-making uh, culture, and also understand the rules of the university system and how rules from, or declarations from UNESCO, from um, uh, United States, from Horizon 2020 Europe, how all those rules will apply to Chile because we are such a small country, whatever happens outside is going to be affecting us very strongly. So we had to understand the internal cultures and the external cultures and movements. We are doing a lot of capacity and community building now that we have secure funding. Uh, we are creating a lot of, um, of um, material um, for people to review when they have the time, but we are also, my colleagues were just doing a, a workshop to show how to use ORCID, uh, ORCID. <laughs> um, and we are going to do a lot of uh, workshops during this year, probably afterward too with our community, but also with other universities. But I think the most important part that we are doing is uh, along with capacity and community building, that, that is one thing that um, allows us to, to go beyond the project. But this spark new conversations. We are moving in the space that we have in the university, but talking to people that usually doesn't talk to um, academics. So for example, we started to uh, create a relationship with administrators in um, the international um, relations uh, department, with the certification department, with um, the um, extension department and and even with other departments that usually just serve somehow the the university but not the academic community per se so we are starting this new conversations on how we all can mutually benefit from what we are doing sharing this system together um, and those conversations are starting new ways to look at the university, how the university organizes itself. And I think that type of conversations is what we need to create to get really a culture of open science in the university, not just in the library or in the academic uh, community. It's, it's the whole university that has to be part of this change. Our project um, is uh, creating a repository, basically for two reasons. One, because of the funding requirement, <laughs> but also because we can control now how we create this repository, how we make it work, how we make it talked to this other parts of the university that were not connected to us before. Um, we have taken a lot of time to get to know research practices, needs, and fears from academics. And we created an ongoing training program, which is very important because like I said, um, very, very few people is aware of what open science is and how it can be beneficial. 
We are also creating a special structure within the university that is not in the library. And that's, I think, very interesting because for our context, the library is not the best place to put this open science structure. Um, we're not quite sure where it's gonna go yet, but we have a few ideas and we want it to be something that is more, um, that allows it to talk to many other parts of the university, like I said before, not just to academics or to the library. And the last thing we're gonna do is create a policy. Why is that the last one? Because we're gonna use all that we have learned in all of these steps before to create the policy that we hope is gonna um, last for, for a long time. Ah, uh, okay. It took me longer than I thought to take to this slide, but what I want you to, um, to take away from this talk is um, aim what, for what you can be and get done, sorry for that. <laughs> Always something uh, missing in, in the last slide, but um, creating policies is, is a lot of work. It can be overwhelming. Um, open science is per se, is a big endeavor. So don't, don't try to make it all at once. Take the part that you can manage and change takes time. So be patient and be kind to yourself. You have to know your people. Uh, you have to really learn what motivates them, what kind of incentives they, they need and how they get affected by different policies, how diversity is, is really everywhere. So don't assume one thing is going to be right for everybody there's always going to be something that is going to affect people in a, in a way that you might not expect it. So take, take a hard look at that. And find allies. Uh, whatever you want to do, you need to find people who, who share your, um, your, your goals. And it's much better to, to do it with them. Share what you know and, and don't waste your energy in haters. <laughs> Um, and then that's what I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that message that, um, I really appreciated the, the broad context that you gave us and the specific examples in the Latin American context. Um, I see folks um, clapping with the, the reaction. Appreciate that. Um, do we have, we have about five minutes, so we could take a question or two. Do we have any questions? I did not see any appear in the chat. Um, I have one um, question I could pose to you. Um, so, a lot of times when we talk about policy, it can be kind of counterintuitive to start with problem definition mm -hmm. because so many of our um, policy conversations start with someone selling a particular solution, selling, so to speak, but they come in very excited about open data or reproducibility or preprints or a particular flavor of open access. And what can you give us some tips to help people take that step back from the maybe the first um, solution that they latch on to? I always go back to context. Uh, every single time I go back to context because maybe one solution works so well in that particular context, in that particular scenario, but um, you probably will have to tweak it a little bit. Is it going to really, I mean, why are you doing what you're doing? <laughs> that's that's the whole point. You, you cannot, when you use a solution just for the sake of it, um, I think it's, it's um, 
it's not useful. Um, it's like using, the, there's this example of people using this um, hammer for everything. And, and you're gonna see, uh, yes, it, it, a different, like you're gonna see a window and you want to use the hammer, you're gonna break it all. So take a step back and, uh, and always wonder, why do I want to use this? Why, what is that I expect to get from this? Um, because maybe there's a much cheaper, easier solution for that. Um, and it's much easier to, to do it in a different way, but that's why I start concentrating on the problem and trying to define the problem and how far I am willing to go to address that problem. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, bringing around to the context is a good way to do that. I'm, I think I'm going to close here with um, echoing the um, comment by Eric Swenson here. Excellent message, especially the focus on practical methodology, objectives, key result mapping, and holistic research. Thank um, you. Really a big picture. Um, <laughs> and a, a, thank, uh, a thanks <laughs> coming in for remembering where we should put our energy, right? Um, bring our energy together with our allies um, to make change for open science policies. Um, I have a, um, let's, um, it's again, a bit of appreciation, virtual or um, real with some applause. And um, we are gonna bring this to a close. I, tomorrow I um, should mention, that the, the conference begins one hour later than it did today. Um, I'm going to quickly, I think, share my screen with the SCED up um, Thursday. Um, it's 11 British Standard Time um, would be the, um, we start with our presentations, um, the presentation session on increasing reliability of science um, and looking ahead um, a global corpus um, and then continue throughout um, two sets of sessions like we've been doing. Um, appreciate everyone's time this um, for this session. And um, I, I will say goodbye for now. Catch you um, at some sessions tomorrow. Thanks again to our speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm glad you like it. <laughs>